Okay, so what, what I thought I would just uh, talk today is kind of a general talk about GIST. Um, I have included some of the medical terms, but I'll try to explain them because I think it's useful that you hear them and maybe get an explanation. So apologies if it's um, a bit too complicated in, in, in places, but maybe give me feedback afterwards. I thought what I would do is just kind of go back over GIST again from the beginning uh, and just describe anatomically what we do um, and how we go about diagnosing and treating GIST and then some new things. And really the new thing that certainly in the Mars and everyone's excited about is robotics. And I just wanted to show you what that is and what that means and maybe how it can be beneficial for some patients. So, I mean, you, you guys probably all do know this, but gastrointestinal stromal tumors we think come from the cells of Cajal, and they're the pacemaker cells that drive the peristalsis in the, um, um, in the gut. Um, they're the commonest non-epithelial tumor in the GI tract. So most cancers you hear of are gonna be an adenocarcinoma, um, and the next most common one will actually be a GIST. And most of them are driven by this particular mutation, which is a tyrosine kinase C kit. Now, tyrosine kinase, what a tyrosine kinase actually is, is it's a mechanism whereby a cell communicates with the environment outside. So the commonest one people would know is insulin. When your um, glucose goes up, the cells respond with this whole mechanism and, and, and tells the body to store, store the um, um, glucose. Um, so these are molecules that in, allow the cell to interact with the environment outside and they're a molecular on-off switch and being very, very simplistic as a surgeon, what it basically means is if it's stuck to on, the cells will grow. Um, but that also is its Achilles heel because it means it's exquisitely sensitive to targeted therapies of which imatinib is probably the best one that we have. Uh, most of them, as you know, are in the, the, the stomach, but they can occur throughout the GI tract. Um, so generally, general principles for a surgeon are that all gists greater than two centimeters should be considered for resection. As I've, is resection is basically the, the surgical verb for taking, taking something out. Um, certainly if they're greater than, than three centimeters, I think one is always thinking about taking them out, but between two and three, they're often observed um, often with, with CT scans. And how do you diagnose them? Well, CT scan in the US, with a, 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 which is an, end, an endoscopy with an ultrasound and then a very fine needle, um, and sometimes a core biopsy, which is where you put a needle in and take a bit of the solid tissue. That's really good for, these, for the big gists because you can get mutational analysis straight away and work out whether people can have um, some, um, whether, whether you can have imatinib before surgery. Um, it's nothing to be frightened of. There, are a, there is a small risk of having seeding, which I've discussed with some of you, but with the modern techniques, usually that doesn't occur. Um, and also, um, um, it, you need to get, get it properly guided so as not to hit a part that's full of, of, of fluid. So the goal of surgery for GIST is to completely remove um, the tumor, and sometimes it's got a pseudo capsule around it. Um, generally what we do is you try to take a segment or a, we call a wedge of the organ. So if it's on the stomach, you just take a little bit of the, the stomach, you don't take the whole thing unless it's a very big tumor. Um, generally a wider resection, so you might have heard of margins for other cancers, so I do melanoma as well and we take a wide margin and that reduces the risk of recurrence with a gist. It doesn't really reduce the risk of recurrence. You want to take just enough tissue to get the tumor out. If, if you're unfortunate and the gist is stuck to some, some other organ, it may be the case that that has to come out, but that's the only reason. And um, as gists don't go to lymph nodes, you can leave them alone. With a lot of the other GI cancers, you do have to take the lymph nodes, um, but we do get opinions and we see people and they, they have had their lymph nodes taken out, but you don't actually need to have that done. Um, I, Imatinib has changed everything with GIST, um, and um, even in my relatively short career, um, um, imatinib has had a profound change. Um, and what it means for me as a surgeon is that if, if, I, if I look at a tumour and say, I think I can take that out, but it looks quite difficult, or if we'll have to take other organs out, I, I will turn to my medical oncology colleagues, um, Robin Jones, Charlotte Benson, and now Spiros, and say, could you give some drug treatment to shrink this tumour back and maybe make the surgery easier for both me and, and the patient? Um, and that's important because although sometimes in the CT scans, initially, first look, and particularly if you're not dealing with GISTs all the time, they can look really scary on a CT. Um, and the, although it might look like it's invading into other organs, it doesn't always. It can just be resting on them. And I'll show you some scans that kind of bear that out. 
Um, particularly the imatinib, it, it can cause the tumour to shrink back away from the, the organ, so you can have little wispy adhesions which come out quite nicely, and that can really be very helpful for surgery. At the time of an operation, what I do, and what most surgeons do, is you look at the actual tumour and then you do a full laparotomy examination. You look at the whole abdomen, you look at the linings, you, you feel the liver and make sure that there aren't any other sites of disease. Sometimes with a GIST, the, the resolution of our CT scans is very, very good now, but even still, there are still little bits of tissue that we can't see with the CT. And it's very important to look for those and take them out when you're there. Um, you have to handle GISTs very, very carefully. Um, they can be cystic, which means that they're full of fluid and they can rupture. And as you know, and as we've discussed, that if you have a rupture at the time of surgery, that puts you in a high-risk group. Now, sometimes the GISTs rupture themselves. That's because they grow very large um, and, and they have a propensity to, to fistulate or, or, or to rupture, but you certainly don't want at the time of surgery to rupture a GIST. Um, what, what you, usually, it is possible to take out um, um, almost all gists um, and the, the real benefit of imatinib um, in that setting is that it shrinks it back but also will reduce the risk of coming back. So there's plenty of ways to take out a uh, gist. Uh, laparotomy or old-fashioned cut is the best way uh, uh, for, for certainly for big tumours and then you have to really decide whether you're going to do a laparoscopic or keyhole approach or a robotic approach and, and really the robot is you know, it's, it's in all the media, it's, it's, uh, it's been a great innovation, but really it's just another way of doing a minimally invasive operation and it might be a way of kind of extending that and giving that to more, to more people. I'll discuss the Marsden, we have a big drive to promote robotic surgery and um, I perform these uh, operations with my colleague here, Asif Chowdhury, and we performed the UK's first um, robotic esophagogastrectomy. Um, and we're pretty sure the first robotic gists and we work as a team and this is us after we're finished our mentorship with um, an OG surgeon from Holland called uh, Richard van Hilsberger who mentored us uh, along the process of learning. Um, you've seen all this before but really after surgery um, as you said y y y when the tumour is taken out you want to look to see if someone gets further treatment and that's des decided upon really based on the size of the tumour, how many cells are dividing where it has arisen and the completeness of removal at surgery. Okay, So in other words, um, the stomach is probably the best prognosis or the best natural history and then other areas, for example the rectum where um, you can get uh, um, the gists are difficult to treat but also have a slightly worse prognosis. Um, I think the real revolution was in 2001 and I think you can split gist into before and after imatinib. Um, and before imatinib, surgery was really the only uh, viable treatment. Um, but as Biros has said, approximately one half of patients, um, the, the tumour would recur. And sometimes complete removal was not possible. And I do remember seeing patients with these very, very big tumours. And it's, 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 it's a real contrast to what we see now. So, um, I'm gonna, I, I've got lots of CT scans, which I will kind of show you what they are. And, and, and when we see a tumour like this, um, this is it at presentation. Um, I'm looking to say, well, that's quite big. It's, it's bigger than five centimeters. It looks like it might be stuck onto organs. So what I will do is ask for imatinib. Um, and then you can see, probably marginally, that the tumor shrinks back. Generally, you give imatinib for about six to 12 months. The timing of surgery is individualized, but really what you want to do is you want to get the tumor to shrink back as much as possible if it's, if it's a, a, an advanced one like this. And that's why the multidisciplinary team experience um, is so important. Um, I think some of the surgery also is dependent on the organ of origin. Um, the stomach is the most common site for GISTs um, and they can arise anywhere, but they most commonly occur in the fundus, which is up here. Um, the spleen is up here as well. Um, but this actually is an area that you, you, you can take out a little bit of the fundus and you should have very little functional, functional compromise or change. The size does vary and as does the relation to surrounding organs. And here's an example, um, they come in all shapes and sizes of, of, of exactly that. This was a small little gist which is just up there in the fundus. This is the spleen here, it's, it's, it's quite nicely away. Um, and this is one we decided with the patient after discussion just to watch it. So what we did is we did CT scans every uh, six months, but it grew 
um, to about 3.7 cent uh, um, centimetres. I was getting a little bit anxious around three, but the patient wanted to keep an eye on it, and that's completely fine. Um, and that came out very nicely laparoscopically. Um, but then the other extreme are tumours like this one, where they present at about 10 centimetres, and we have to shrink them back. Initially, when, when, when I saw this patient, I thought, well, you know, I could do an open resection, um, but perhaps if we just give imatinib, we can shrink it back, reduce the extent of surgery. And in fact, in this case, um, this was a, a patient who ultimately went on to have a robotic resection. And th what's really pleasing about that is you can reduce, you know that you're going to reduce the tumor, you know you're going to reduce the extent, but then to be able to do a robotic or laparoscopic procedure after the imatinib, meaning the patient could go home in one or two days, I think is a real fantastic change. And it's the, that's when people talk about multidisciplinary treatment Really, it's, it's all of the people with the skill sets, and when it works for patients like this, it can work really, really well. Um, on the other extreme then, this is a, a very big tumor, which is quite cystic. Uh, it's difficult to make out, but it looks, quite, it looks quite dark, and that's because it's lots and lots of fluid, and it's, a hundred, it's, it's, it's a 12 centimeters in diameter. Um, and this little thing here is the pancreas that it's lying on, and up here is the spleen, kind of compressed by the tumour. And despite having um, a good response to imatinib, it didn't really shrink, the activity decreased. And unfortunately, in this case, it's intimate um, to all of these surrounding organs, and therefore they had to be taken out as part of the operation. And I'll kind of show you closer up here. That it's, 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 it's really impossible to differentiate between um, the pancreas and the spleen here. So in, in this case, um, I did have to take out all of the surrounding organs, not, not the kidney actually, um, but the surrounding organs had to be taken out. And that can be done safely. And here is the gentleman, even though he didn't have a laparoscopic approach or minimally invasive approach, three weeks later he w marched in the Marsden March uh, and was the biggest uh, fundraiser last year. So it's not the end of the world having um, open surgery. I think surgeons can be quite wedded to their toys and their techniques, but the most important thing is that you've got the, the safest uh, best way of getting the tumour out um, and you have to match that to the individual patient. Uh, again, some, of, some, some just really don't respond very well um, and this again is another massive tumour and the pancreas was, was involved um, and in this case um, I did have to do a, a subtotal gastrectomy um, and, and that can be, can be troublesome but you know th this patient's done very well and what you do is you reconstruct the um, outflow tract by bringing up the bowel to do what we call a roux and y reconstruction. Um, and um, you still have to do these procedures sometimes, but the most important thing is that the um, tumor's gone um, and that you're well afterwards. So the small bowel, the small bowel basically is all of the bowel after the stomach, and that includes the duodenum. This bit from here onwards is very floppy, but the duodenum here is not very floppy, it's quite stuck, um, um, and the pancreas uh, goes behind the stomach here, and then the, the uh, digestive fluid goes in here and then helps, helps you digest the food. But um, the most common site is actually around here in the jejunum, so in the kind of mid bowel, and that's quite easy to deal with. It, it presents often with ulceration or bleeding. They can be very mild, but sometimes they can be very, very big tumors. And all the other symptoms you would get with a bowel obstruction like pain, weight loss, or perforation can be a common uh, uh, method of presentation. They generally are on the outside of the bowel, so they don't tend to obstruct all that much, but it can be a rare presenting symptom. So what do we do with small bowel? Well, here, here's an example of quite a big one, um, and most of the cases that I see are quite advanced, and, and yes, I think in the Morrison we do push it with laparoscopy. You know, I think some places will not do a laparoscopic approach if you've got a, a, a a tumour bigger than five centimetres, but I guess we push it a little bit. Um, but what your aim is to do is to take the little segment of bowel out. That's fine, because you've got so much bowel, small bowel, it doesn't really matter. You can have four and a half to, to six metres of bowel, and you just need a small amount for function. And in a case like this, you've got all the options available, an open procedure, a laparoscopic procedure, um, or, or robotic. And really, the size of the tumour and the skill of the, of, of the multidisciplinary team is what would decide. Um, in this case, I did a, a laparoscopic approach, and when I do it laparoscopically, I'd stitch everything up inside as well. Um, and I think that's because 
sometimes you can lift the bowel out and do your anastomosis, but I think that you have a much better functional result. The bowel doesn't freeze up. Um, and again, it's about getting the patients home quickly, safely, and then getting you onto your imatinib as quickly as possible. So I put people back on you know, the next week. Um, small bowel is funny, um, and this is what I mean about tumors looking quite dramatic, but not really being as bad as you think. You can see a lump here, you can see a lump here, it isn't projecting very well, so I'm pointing it out, and you can see one here. So initially, you look at this and go, that's a terribly big pelvic tumor, but actually, it's just in the bowel, and every time you take a scan, it moves around, and then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So although it looks really dramatic to begin with, um, they can actually be uh, quite nice. Um, sometimes, um, they're in the proximal bowel, and that can be quite difficult. So this is a, a young man who presented with bleeding, and this is a PET scan, is what Spiros was talking about earlier. This shows increased metabolic activity, which corresponds to this tumor here. And that's one way of identifying, um, one, that there's a tumor there, and two, when you give imatinib, this, uh, the metabolic activity shuts down. So it's a good way of, of, of monitoring response. Um, this was quite a difficult tumor to take out, and this was definitely not one I was going to do laparoscopically. Um, so I took it out and then did what we call an end-to-end -end anastomosis. So I took the bowel and just stitched it back up together. Um, and um, this was clear of tumor, but or cl the margins were clear, but because it was quite a high-risk gist, um, basically that patient is now on a matinib and doing very, very well. Um, the duodenum is quite difficult. Um, it's, it's, the reason it's difficult is because sometimes you do need quite big surgery. Again, what we try to do is a wedge resection, and what that means is you just take a little bit of the duodenum out. Otherwise, because of the blood supply, if you have a big gist, you might need to have what's called a Whipple's procedure. And that's a large, a very, very, it, it's a big operation whereby you have to take out the head of the pancreas, and because of the blood supply, you have to take out the end of the stomach, the gallbladder, and then reconstruct. So, I think people with duodenal gists are very, you know, best served to be treated in a place where there's expertise in both hepatobiliary and in gist. And what we do with these is um, generally uh, Amir Khan uh, or myself or one of the other sarcoma team members will see these patients and we will always try to give them atinib because even if they're small, if you can shrink them back, then you might be able to avoid such big surgery. And Amir now is also starting to do robotic surgery and um, that can be something that works very, very well as well. Um, rectal gist is quite rare, about 5% of all gists. Um, and it could present in the same way that, that other rectal cancers would present, with bleeding, constipation, abdominal discomfort. They're challenging because the pelvis is quite small. This is the rectum and there's, the pelvis is basically like a bony bowl inside. Again, imatinib can be very, very helpful. I'll show you why. Um, from a prognostic point of view, the outcomes were always poor before imatinib, and we know that it's just it's, it's, it's a poor site um, to develop it. But the type of surgery you can do can vary from just taking out the rectum and reconstructing to taking out the entire back passage, which obviously is life-changing for people. And this is, again, where um, imatinib has been a real um, game-changer. And our experience in the Mars, and this is my colleagues, um, Professor Judson and, and Paris Tekis, what we found when we looked specifically, for example, at the, at the um, rectum, was that you can, again, enable sphincter-preserving surgery. In other words, just take out the segment of bowel, um, and that you could really shrink back the tumor, making um, surgery much easier. And when we looked at big centers like Memorial Sloan Kettering as well, they have a very, very similar uh, finding, and that is that the survival and local control appear independent of the extent of surgery. What that means is you don't need big surgery, you don't need to take out these organs, you just do enough to take out the tumour um, and then people do just fine. Um, and here are examples and you can see in the pelvis this is quite a big tumour. This is the bladder in front, um, these are the hips and this is the bones and, and you can see that there's very little space in there. Um, but this tumour started off at nine centimetres and then reduced and reduced, and even here you can see there's a bit more space to operate. Um, and that allowed, um, unfortunately in this case I couldn't spare the rectum, um, but it allowed much easier surgery. And if this was an adenocarcinoma, another type of tumor, or before imatinib, you would have to think about taking out the bladder. 
Similarly, in this case, this was a very cystic tumour to begin with, and it shrunk back to a very, very nice one, and um, that allowed me to take the rectum out and reconstruct everything, um, and the patient's done very, very well with very good function. For people with metastatic gist, the, the question is, in, in the era of imatinib, like, what is the role for surgery? And I think that there are some reasons to consider surgery, and I'll outline them here and then just look at a little bit of the evidence. The tumour growth is controlled in lots of patients, but you, you don't always get complete response. Um, eventually, people will get mutations, and then the, the response to second-line treatment isn't always uh, as durable. Um, so the idea is that surgery may be able to remove disease before you get secondary uh, resistance, um, and then can, can get rid of um, resistant clones. So who, who does it benefit? Well, we have looked at this, and there, unfortunately trials didn't accrue enough patients, so we rely on big institutional series like ourselves, Boston, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and what it does appear is that some people who are responding to imatinib or just have a small area of progression or what we call oligometastatic disease, just a few areas of progression may benefit from surgery or other interventions like um, ablative therapies. Um, people who've got like, generalized multifocal disease progression um, don't, don't generally benefit. And, and some of that's for very practical reasons. If there are other lines of treatment available, which there are now, many lines, then you're better taking them because they will treat everything. But also with surgery, y y there are complications and you can prevent people actually getting onto treatment which will benefit them. Um, that's basically the, the, the Boston and Memorial Sloan Kettering um, um, combined their data and that's what they found that basically the pa patients who are responding who have low volume metastatic disease can have improved progression free survival that's time without disease. Um, I've recently been a co-author on, yep. Sorry, can you talk again about the new slide please? This one or? Um, this is just a, 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 a review that I'm co-author of recently and we've basically, um, the big European centres looked at the, the literature and, and again came to the same conclusions that people with responsive disease, stable disease, unifocal disease, or, um, or it can be, it can be metastatic just can be divided into these groups but the people who've got stable or responsive disease um, may benefit. And here's an example of, a, of, of again a young man who had um, metastatic gist and had one area um, which was stable um, and in view of the fact that I if this escaped treatment and uh, continued to grow in due course um, it could cause problems then uh, we elected to take this, this out and um, a very very straightforward operation it, a lot easier than it looked uh, tumour came out and a couple of other sites of disease and he's remained disease free so if you pick the right patients this uh, surgery can still be beneficial um, so what I thought I would do is, is just introduce robotic surgery and why we do it, and then I would like to show a, a video which shows a combination of laparoscopic and robotic surgery, just to show you guys what actually happens at the time of surgery and some of the perceived benefits. Um, the Royal Marsden, we've had a, um, uh, we've had a, a robotic program for quite a while. In 2007, we were the first hospital in the UK to get the Da Vinci S. In 2015, Don McCarthy uh, gave a, a significant amount of money to buy one of the new Da Vinci XIs, um, making us the first hospital in England to use the robot. Um, we started a fellowship program in 2015, um, and we continue to perform rare surgeries that aren't available elsewhere. Um, we now have two XI robots, which is uh, very helpful. So we're probably the most comprehensive program in the UK and really every, every site, every disease site I think has at least one person who's dedicated to trying to um, promote robotic surgery and use robotic surgery in their particular field. Um, we've done two and a half thousand uh, operations in the last decade and uh, in the last year we have 500 uh, cases. Um, and also what we're trying to do really is to drive innovation have patients have smarter, kinder techniques, and one of the ways we're doing that is by employing, um, is by generating uh, fellowship programs and training people to be the next generations of surgeons. Um, as I said, we, we performed the first esophageal gastric resection. Um, 
we did that two years ago, um, and if you're interested, the patient, he didn't have GIST, but he had an, esophag um, he had an esophageal cancer, and he's recently been interviewed, uh, as has my colleague Asif. You can see me playing in the background, uh, if you look closely at the robot, um, but just explaining the impact that the surgery had on him, and it was all positive, and that's still available in the player, and we're going to get more coverage soon um, with, with a GIST case on uh, BBC Click. Um, our program has gone very well. Uh, we've done about 30 cases um, with the robot, about four um, gastric gist to date, and we've done, I think, about 25 or 26 esophageal gastrectomies. Um, the benefits are inside, everything is 3D. It's magnified. Um, I don't know if any of you have looked at the kind of PlayStations or the 3D virtual reality stuff, but this is like on a whole different level of clarity. Um, What's great about it is that you can move your wrists the, in real time and it's replicated by the arms inside. So when you move like this, the robot hand will move. It, it, lapar laparoscopy, you have to invert everything, um, but these are very natural movements. You can have things like fluorescence, which I think may be beneficial in the future. But what's great as a surgeon is you can, you, you can interchange the instruments. So you ask for an instrument, it gets put in and out, the particular tool that you want. And I'll show you that, but for the surgeon, it's very ergonomic, uh, or the ergonomics are great. We can sit down at a console, um, so we're completely in control of the robot. The robot doesn't do anything itself. So you sit at a console and these arms move and correspond to your movements. So, you know, it, 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 it's a fantastic controlled environment for us, and surgically, it's very good for awkward areas inside. Um, so this is an example of, of a case um, that I did recently. Um, this is a patient who's had previous cancers, the main one being having a, a previous colon cancer, having open surgery, and that meant that there was a lot of adhesions inside. Um, she had an incidentally found uh, GIST, which we gave a matnib treatment to, tumor shrunk, um, but unfortunately the, the, the side effects were troublesome, and as we'd gotten a good response, but, but she couldn't tolerate the uh, drug treatment anymore, we decided to elect for surgery. I discussed all the various methods and just thought, well, we should try at least to have a robotic approach, um, even if the person, or, or even if she had adhesions, because adhesions are not necessarily a contraindication. It makes it a little bit more difficult for us because we have to take them down when you go inside, but I thought that the benefit would outweigh the trouble that, that, that it may or may not cause. So we'll look at this tumour and I will show you what it's like. And again, it's in a slightly awkward position. This big thing here is the liver. Um, here is the top of the stomach, the fundus. This is the gist, and this is the spleen. You can see that it's, it's kind of nestled in there, and there's some soft tissue connecting it. Um, and this is, in areas like this, the robot's quite helpful because it can reach all the way up and you can dissect very finely. But, you know, one of the considerations is, can you take it off the spleen? Does the spleen have to come off, and can you take the pancreas? So, if you'll indulge me, I thought I would show you um, my video, video editing is, is very amateur. You need to squeeze Well, I don't think so. I think there's a tiny little bit of blood and you can see the tumour. So I, I, I was a bit concerned. Does anyone? Um, Spiros is on the floor, so. Well, hospital Okay, well look, I'll, I'll put it on, hopefully, hopefully it's okay, um, and um, I'll try and talk you through what's going on. So this is the initial dissection, so as you can see these are the adhesions, and before I put in the other ports I wanted to take down these adhesions um, and the bowel that's stuck from the previous surgery, and that's so as not to cause any damage. There's not usually much, there's a little bit of blood here, blood vessel, but normally there isn't in these adhesions. So the next thing then is to mobilize the stomach, and we use these really cool energy devices. This one uses ultrasound energy. This is the stomach on the left, and this is what we call the omentum. But this is where some of the blood supply from the stomach comes from, the short gastrics. So this can cut and seal, and then you disconnect the stomach all the way up along, and you'll start to see the tumor appearing here, and the spleen behind it. Um, so initially we dissected all the way up to expose the tumour and then you can see some of these adhesions from the tumour and they're smaller probably because of the imatinib stuck onto this this fatty tissue here. 
And here you go, here's the tumor. So what the next thing we do is we dock the robot and you literally target it. So I put in the camera and then this target, I will bring this up to where the tumor is and then this will allow the robot, when, when you say this is the target we're going for, to adjust the arms of the robot so that it will um, put the arms in the right place to make the, the operation easier. So, so then when you have the robot docked, you, you're putting these, this is a robot uh, instrument, so my hand movements um, correspond to what happens here. We're cleaning up the area because the blood leaches the light and then I'm taking control and just going to examine the tumour now uh, and its relations and I'm very, very gingerly pushing it with the hands as opposed to grabbing it because I'm aware it's cystic. But you can't see it, but I'm able to see in three dimensions up and over to that one area that I showed you on the CT that was really bothersome. And then we can put electricity in to continue the dissection and that will seal that tissue there and take it away. And then I've changed, that's the heart beating way up there by the way, I've changed to a scissors um, and th this allows really nice fine dissection. And I think this is one of the reasons that we like the, the robot so much. They get the magnification, you can see that you're nicely away from the tumour and it's, it's a really, really nice dissection with, um, and, you, and you're very clear that you've got nice clean margins. So I'm trying to take off all these adhesions and you'll see at the end that the stalk the tumour comes from is very small. Now that's I'm doing my best to lift it up without touching the tumour. And you can see the way I poked it in there, that's, that shows how cystic it is. But when it's all dissected off, this is all that it, that, that's there. This is, this is as if my colleague, like in the football, showing me where he wants me to, to, to cut it. Um, and you can even see optically, there's a slight difference in, or sorry, here, I'm, look, just showing that, that um, at the back, that's the little bridge of tissue, that it's all completely clear. Um, but it's actually quite a small stalk um, that, it's, that it's arisen from. So what I'm going to do now is put in a stapler. Um, the ports that go in nowadays, I always use blunt ports. Um, it can only go in as far as that little black marker. Um, and this is fluorescence. Now this is pretty cool. Um, this is going to light up the tumour um, along the blood vessels. And um, what the benefit of this is, is if you can make it out, I can kind of see, you can kind of see a cutoff point here. Now, it, it, there's a bit of flaring, but the idea in the future for, for robotics and for a lot of the surgery is that, that we will have intraoperative markers to help you clearly define uh, the margin. Um, and this, this now is going to help me in putting in the stapler. I don't know what the noise is. Um, and I have complete control over where to place the stapler and what this will do is it will place two lines of, uh, 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 sorry, three lines of staples and in the middle is a blade. So I will identify the spot and you can see here, there's, you can see it's nice pink tissue and tumour tissue. I will slide this in and then compress the tissue and it will close and cut the tissue and, and that will be how we will remove the, the tumour. So what happens now is I'm putting my putting the tumour in, make, or putting the stapler in, making sure without compressing anything that I've got a clear margin and I'm very happy with it. Also making sure that my colleague Asif as co-pilot is happy with the margin. We're very happy with that. And then what you'll start to see here is some, um, in a moment when I apply pressure, um, the robot can detect when the pressure is correct and then it will allow me to fire with the countdown. So uh, in a moment, it will appear So what I want to do is make sure as well that everything is within the, uh, you can cut between here and here. Um, so what we're doing here is discussing about have we, have we got enough tissue within the stapler and we decided we didn't. So I moved the um, stapler down a little bit or moved the, the stomach down into the stapler and then we're in our final position to uh, divide. So then what happens is you clamp, unclamp, reclamp and this will um, tell me when it's ready to fire then a countdown will happen and the tumour will come off. So when I release the hands inside, you'll see that the tumour will fall away nicely 
and there's just a very fine staple line. And you can see there's a very, very little stomach has been removed. Um, now we'll remove this, uh, put in different, different kind of hands, and then we'll place this in a bag uh, and take it out safely um, through, through uh, one of the port sites. And putting it in a bag will ensure um, that you don't seed the wounds with any tumour. And again, you always make sure that you don't grab the actual tumour, but I'm taking the staple line and we'll put it in a, in a bag. And this is how we take out appendixes and gallbladders through these bags. Um, but I thought it'd be nice to actually show what happens. So it's kind of a slam dunk at the end. Yeah, they're really, they, they, they're really well designed. They're really well designed. <laughs> yeah. So you pull from the outside the string and it'll close it and come out. So I think that's all cool and that's great fun for me, but the best thing... <laughs> Oh, thanks. But the, the best thing is that this, this lady just stayed for two days. She was two days and she was home. Um, she had a little bit of pain, and I admit because we had done it robotically and because I was kind of, you know, she had adhesions and all the rest, um, I did a CT scan, which was probably too much, but there was nothing abnormal. Um, and then when we took out the, the gist and sent it for histology, it's actually a low risk gist. So, you know, she no, doesn't need any more imatinib. The plan is for a CT in one year, and if that's normal, she'll be for discharge. So what else is new? I'm just going to show you one or two other things that we're thinking. Well, as, as I mentioned to some of you, there, there is a slightly higher incidence of, of second primary cancers in GIST. I'm not telling you this to worry you, but more that if you have had a GIST, don't not turn up for any colonoscopic screening. So there is a higher risk of, of, of tumours. They appear to be in the colon. Um, and just because you've had one tumour doesn't mean that you won't get another. And please do go for your colon screening. That's the main point of that. One of the things that we would like to do and we're talking about it is with, with Dr. Christina Messieu, um, and some of you might know Dr. Gina Brown, who's helped revolutionize treatment of rectal cancer, which is something they used to do. Um, but looking, what we'd like to do is really define the imaging for GIST in the rectum and elsewhere to kind of look at things like geography, invasion, and response, so that basically we can have a systematic way that surgeons can go, well, what do I need to take out and how, how can we do that? And I think that in time, I don't want to overhype it, but I think that we probably will develop in time things like tumor-specific fluorescence that will help us identify where to cut properly and to reduce the amount of, of organs that are taken out. So I think in summary, I think imatinib has really revolutionized the outcomes and it's also changed surgery. Um, the method of surgery, how, how you perform surgery for GIST, it's an interplay of tumor location, the skill set of the multidisciplinary team and, and people's response to imatinib. Large tumours um, or in difficult locations benefit from imatinib and that's a conversation often between the medical oncologist and the surgeon. Um, Robin Jones and the guys will turn to me and say, what do you think of taking that out, Miles? And I'll say, I think we'll, we'll benefit from imatinib and I think that that's, that's what's, th that kind of crosstalk is very beneficial for patient care. Um, it can reduce the extent of surgery and may be helpful um, in patients with metastatic disease who are responding to imatinib. Um, I think Minimally invasive surgery may now be performed robotically. It may have added benefits for patients and surgeons, but the main thing is to get the tumour out. And if you have open surgery, then that's the right type of surgery to have. At one year, people are the same, okay? So it's the, the initial benefit with laparoscopic and minimally invasive surgery is normally the, the initial um, um, few months. Um, but at one year, most outcomes are the same. Yes, there's a bigger scar, but that's okay. Um, there's a, there is an incidence of second cancers in GIST, um, and I think that going forward, having standardized reporting of imaging would be very helpful for surgeons, and I think things like fluorescence um, could, be really, could really aid stuff. Um, there's three of us in the sarcoma unit, and Amir Khan also is uh, um, uh, the three main surgeons in the uh, MDT, Dirk Strauss, uh, myself, and Andrew Hayes. Um, and Amir Khan, who I showed you earlier, and um, Asif Chowdhury, we all work very closely together. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for allowing me to speak to you, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you.